of preaching a couple of revivals in Gina, Louisiana and uh, eating Sister Coon and her mother's cooking, praise God. I'll tell you what, her mother is one of the greatest cooks in all of central Louisiana. We're honored to have you here tonight, Brother Coon. I want you to take your liberty in the Lord. God bless you. Thank you for consenting to come. Let's welcome you. Thank you, Brother Calhoun. Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's clap our hands to the Lord. What are you saying? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. Oh, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord. And everybody said, praise the Lord. And you may be seated. The Lord bless you. What a joy to be in this uh, ladies' meeting tonight. But how comforting it is to have all of you men here. Hallelujah. Praise God. I've preached a few women's conferences and a few women's only meetings. And I can just tell you that that's about the most uncomfortable feeling in all the world. Amen. Not that I have a bias against ladies, but uh, it's just a different feeling when there's not any men around. So I'm glad you guys showed up tonight. Praise God. And to all you wonderful ladies, Lord bless you for what you're doing for Mother's Memorial. And what a joy to be with you tonight, to be in this beautiful church, this beautiful building, uh, to be with Brother Littlefield, the members of this church. God bless you, Brother Littlefield. He was just telling me he used to work for Justice Oil Company. Uh, they're headquartered in Gina, Louisiana. That's about the only thing that's got headquarters there. But anyway, Justice Oil Company is there. And... Uh, they just uh, in the oil field business. But nevertheless, it's a joy to be here in this service tonight and uh, be with all of you good folks here in Texas. I've enjoyed a lot of times of coming to be in your district and always had a wonderful time. In fact, um, I think I was in your section five, six years ago for a little Christmas meeting. Uh, Brother Watkins and uh, all of the ministers. Certainly good to see him tonight. Brother Proctor, your secretary, and all of the wonderful pastors and evangelists that are here tonight. God bless you. I give honor to you, and especially to Brother and Sister Calhoun. I really love and appreciate the Calhouns, and I think they're wonderful people. And I'm going to tell you, now Brother Calhoun's a good preacher, and he's a good man. But I'm going to tell you, he has one of the finest Christian wives in all of the world. And I've said that to everybody, to your back and to her back. And so I can say it to their face tonight. Sister Calhoun is a very, very special lady that really loves the work of God. And I have a lot of respect for them and their family and their children. And uh, as I said, he is an outstanding preacher. Praise the Lord. And, uh, you know, I just feel right at home tonight, and I think I'll just make myself at home. Is that all right? Praise God. Hallelujah. Now, we might as well all just relax, and uh, I've, I've had a little time to look you over, and you've had a little time to look me over, and uh, y'all all look fine to me, and I hope I look all right to you, but this is not a watch night service. Amen. So let's quit watching each other and have church. What do you say? Praise God. Amen. I was, uh, I, I felt a little embarrassed about coming to church tonight. Sister Coon, uh, she won't even be happy about me saying this, I don't imagine. But uh, And I'm so delighted she's with me. We have been together for almost 47 years. And uh, we we got married on Wednesday night and started a revival on Sunday night. 
And we've been in the work of the Lord ever since. So we've been around a long time together in the work of the Lord. But uh, we left to come to this rally. I had to go to Houston yesterday. And so uh, I left and yesterday and spent the night and then come on up to Tyler today. And so when I left home, as always, I was in a little hurry. And so I run in my closet and... Uh, I had a suit that I had just bought not long ago, and I thought, you know, if I'm going to go to Tyler, Texas, I need to be a dressed-up coon, so uh, I better wear my newest suit. So I grabbed that new suit and uh, a matching necktie and shoes to match and belt to match and stuck it in a bag real quick, <clears throat> handed it to Sister Coon, and uh, here we are, and I got out that nearly new suit. It was brown, my suit was. But when I got it out and started to put it on, I've got on a gray suit. I got the wrong suit. And uh, so I have absolutely nothing on that matches tonight. <clears throat> Hallelujah. And so if I don't preach well, you blame it on that, all right? <laughs> Praise God. And uh, if I do well, you blame it on that. Hallelujah. <laughs> And uh, we'll let it go with that. Now, I, you say, well, I don't know if I want to listen to you or not if you have that kind of problem. Well, the Lord bless you. I was I was teaching at the campground, I think, in a men's conference here in Texas. And most of the time when I get up to preach, I'll take my watch off and either stick it in my pocket or stick it in my Bible so that when I get up here, I can put it up here. And I am watching my watch, by the way. I'm going to preach till the mall closes, and I'm going to quit before McDonald's closes, and uh, if that'll help you any. And uh, so I got up to speak at the uh, campground, I believe it was a men's conference, and somebody was preaching after me. I had the first uh, message, and then somebody was following me, so I had to quit pretty much on time, and I was very conscious of it. Well, I got up to preach. And uh, so I felt in my pocket for my watch, and I didn't have it. And I looked all in my Bible. I turned it up, and I felt in my pockets. And I said, my, my, I have lost my watch. And I, I didn't know if I dropped it on the floor what had happened. And so I had to do something because there was no clock on the wall. So I mentioned that I had lost my watch, and I needed to watch. And Brother Kilgore, he was on the platform, and he said, well, Brother Coon, We'll buy you a watch if you lost your watch. And you can borrow mine uh, for tonight. I said, okay. So I borrowed his watch, and I preached, and I quit on time. And uh, I went back where I was sitting, looked for my watch, couldn't find it. Felt in my pockets again, couldn't find it. Didn't know what in the world happened to it. Got home that night and uh, to the motel, started to go to bed, and took off my shirt. And there was my watch on my arm. <laughs> I said, hallelujah in hell. So, uh, again, I don't know if you want to listen to me preach or not. Praise God. But uh, if we can get past everything else, I believe the Lord can help us here tonight. Don't you? Praise God. How many of you want the Lord to talk to you tonight? Praise God. Praise God. Now, let me say this, and I'll get into the Word of the Lord. I did not do this, and I still have nothing to do with it. I've never once in my lifetime, to my church or to anywhere else, classified myself as a Bible teacher. Somewhere along the way, I guess I sort of got classified as that, and I wind up uh, most of the time teaching in some kind of a teaching session, be it a camp meeting, a conference, or a seminar, or whatever. And uh, to be honest, I, I enjoy that. Now, I, I try to preach evangelistically in my local church. Don't go out and do much of it. And I don't know what you come expecting tonight. <clears throat> and I don't know that you would call this a Bible lesson, but I've just got a little practical, down-to-earth thought that I would like to leave with you tonight. And um, I want the Lord to help us. Praise God. I've got enough sense to know the devil's fighting everybody in this building. Amen. If you're trying to live right, the devil's fighting you. Praise God. And I'm not here to cause you any more trouble. 
I'm here to encourage you tonight. I'm here to help you be stronger, to walk out of here better. Praise God. If you're a pastor, if you're an evangelist, you're, the enemy certainly is fighting you tonight, but I believe God has a word for us. Praise the Lord. You want to hear from the Lord tonight? Praise God. Let's stand and pray and ask the Lord to come down and talk to our hearts tonight. Come on, let's ask the Lord to anoint. Ask Him to bless us tonight. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. amen. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's clap our hands to the Lord again. Praise God. Come on, let's let the Holy Ghost talk to us tonight. Glory to God. Let's let the Word of the Lord speak to us tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Amen, amen, amen. If you have your Bibles, I have one verse of Scripture I would like to read in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter number 10 and verse 10. Pardon me for taking off my jacket. I told you I'd make myself at home. That's what I do at home. And uh, I feel a little more comfortable out of that. <clears throat> so you pardon that. Praise the Lord. Ecclesiastes, chapter number 10 and verse number 10. The writer, and this is a very practical common sense, down-to-earth statement. And it is biblical. Uh, <clears throat> bishop Tobin, <clears throat> black bishop from Indianapolis, pastor there for many years, long been dead, he used to say that God is not very far from common sense. And uh, after all these years of pastor, and I agree with him, God's not very far from common sense. And common sense is pretty rare nowadays. <clears throat> Amen. But uh, this is a very common sense, biblical statement. And it simply says, If the iron be blunt, and he do not wet the edge, then must he put to more strength. But wisdom is profitable to direct. Let me read it again. If the iron be blunt... And he do not whet the edge, then must he put to more strength. But wisdom is profitable to direct. And everybody said, Amen. And you may be seated. The Lord richly bless you. I want to preach tonight or teach or talk, whatever you want to call this, for the next little while, <clears throat> on the law of use. The law of use. Now... Again, very practically, very simply, I think that all of us are uh, aware of the fact that anything that you use, and when I uh, use this term here, I'm talking about something that is put into action, something that is uh, used in some type of a service or in some type of a purpose. Anything that you use on a constant basis, has a certain degree of wear. Of course, I'm, I'm not overly familiar with it. Most of us are familiar somewhat with the law of thermodynamics and uh, the aging process and the wearing process and all of that. And it appears in this particular passage, and especially from this particular time frame, uh, whenever you read this, <clears throat> your mind automatically or quite quickly uh, imagines or goes to a picture of someone that is using an iron type of instrument, be it a tool or a plow or something of that, uh, perhaps maybe it'd be right to say primitive age. Uh, our minds sort of uh, develop an image and a picture uh, from this particular verse where he's talking about if the iron is blunt and he do not wet the edge, then he's got to put forth more strength. And, and we automatically, in our minds, begin to see a picture of someone that is, is cutting with something that is using an axe or a blade or some type of a cutting instrument. <clears throat> and it is being used over and over and over and over again in the same process. And as a result of that process, <clears throat> actually and automatically, 
The edge becomes blunt. Solomon here said the iron is blunt. And, and it dulls it. Now we, we, we use the term dull. And, uh, I have a pocket knife in my pocket. And, and it is typically as always, it's, it's dull because I, I don't use it for things that you're supposed to use pocket knife for. I use it to open tin cans and, and scrape all stuff off of steel and all of that, which is not smart. And so consequently my knife stays dull all of the time. The iron is blunt because I have been using it over and over and over again. And there is a law of use. There is a principle of use that whenever you consistently and continually use the same thing, after a while it becomes dull, it becomes depleted, it is gone. Uh, we often refer to the story of Hagar in the wilderness whenever the Lord uh, prepared a well of water for her. The Bible said the, the bottle that she had, the, the, the thing that she took the water with uh, or in whenever she left Abraham's house, the Bible said that the water was spent in the bottle. She was simply using that to take a drink in that dry, arid country time after time. And consequently, it was spent. It was used up. Uh, the Bible talks about a woman uh, in the New Testament with an issue of blood. <clears throat> and the Bible gives us the story very clearly that she was constantly going to physicians. And of course, that cost money and she was going. And, and the Bible said when she had spent all that she had, she had just kept giving out and giving out and giving out until all of her money was gone. And, and obviously we all are smart enough to know you just keep using your money. Just keep using the money out of your bill pole. And after a while you look in there and there's none there. Now, <clears throat> I don't know how you do it. It's just a little silly personal thing. Um, along the way I'll get, I don't never carry much money and I'll get a little money and I'll put it in my bill pole. <clears throat> and so as I go through the weeks and or through the days, I'll, I'll take a little bit out and I'll buy this and I'll buy that. And all of a sudden, Brother Proctor, uh, without replenishing it, I, I discover I'm broke and I don't have any money. And, uh, it's a little, uh, it's a little expensive to borrow money from Sister Coon. If any of you know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> but nevertheless, if you just, it doesn't matter what it is. Just anything in life. You just use it and you use it and you use it. And after a while, something develops. And, and, and it is gone. Just like the prodigal son, the Bible said when he had spent all, after a while, everything is gone. Over and over and over, that story replicates itself in the Scripture. Uh, <clears throat> whenever you read the story of the widowed prophet's wife, and uh, how did uh, the, the prophet come to her? And he asked her, said, what is in your house? And she simply said, there is nothing but a pot of oil. Now we know the result of that, and it was a tremendous miracle. But the truth is, that poor lady had used everything until it was all but gone. The, the common story of the widow of, widow of Zarephath, the Bible said that all she had was a handful of meal in a barrel and a little bit of oil in a cruise. Amen. That constant use, that constant life is a draining process. And oh, brother, does anybody here know how that life drains the energy and the strength and the desire and the fight out of our lives? But I'm here to tell you, there's a God that knows how to restore us and how to renew us and how to revive us. Praise God. And I believe tonight can be a reviving service for everybody in this building. Hallelujah. Oh God, stir us up again. Oh God, anoint us again. Oh God, awaken us again as never before in our lives. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many of you want the Lord to renew you a little bit tonight? <clears throat> oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Praise God. Praise God. Brother, I'm telling you, if you've got all you need and you just right up to where you want to be and, and everything is so fine with you and, and you just don't need a little more strength and a little more courage and a little more faith, I sure would look, like to hug your neck after church. <clears throat> I've just never run across a creature like that. Amen. But every one of us, every one of us, 
Oh, brother, we know the need of that refreshing of the presence of the Lord in our lives. Hallelujah. I have preached from it many, many, many times. And I'm sure that other preachers have. It's a common story. It's a needed story that we need reminding of again and again. It's the story of the five wise and the five foolish virgins. I read that story and, and we can preach their doom, uh, that of the five foolish. We can preach their, their mistake. We can preach their folly. And, and that's the reason they was called foolish virgins. And, and, and they were foolish for a reason. And the Bible designates them as that. And, and that word fool is, is, is not just a word that you play with. According to the scripture, there's restrictions on it. And, and there's some divine decrees about using that word. But the Lord Himself, uh, described these five as being foolish virgins. And the reason that they were foolish was because that the oil was thrown out of their lamps. And they had none in their vessels. I have preached their doom and I have preached them standing at the door and, and going to buy some oil. And while they go to buy, the, the bridegroom comes and they're left. We preach that story. But <clears throat> I've often looked at that. And the thing that strikes me is this. That, that at one time, apparently, they had all in their vessels and all in their lamps. But something happened that it was gone. I don't think that they just poured it out. I don't think they were just reckless individuals. I think the thing that happened was they just kept using that strength and using that spirit and using that power to fight and never putting anything back until one day they woke up and it was too late. My God, I'm going to tell this crowd something. Every preacher, every saint of God, this is a generation of giving out and giving out and giving out and producing and producing and producing. Uh, but oh God, we need to get something put on the inside of us. Uh, we need for God to renew us again uh, and get something afresh down inside of our hearts. Hallelujah be to God. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> Amen. You've got a lot of them here in Texas. And we've got some of them in Louisiana. And you, you at one time worked for an oil company. We talk, and, and this is common talk around Gina. <clears throat> they'll, they'll drill all well. And, and you heard this old talk. Uh, Brother Little Phil, and, and somebody will bring in a new well. And then the first question is, how much does it make? How much does it make? Oh man, that's a good well. It's making 60 barrels a day. Making 75 barrels a day. It's a flowing well. <clears throat> or it's not too good. Making 12 barrels a day. The real truth is, all wells don't make a drop of oil. They really don't. <laughs> they don't make a drop of oil. You know what all wells do? They just pump the oil that's in the ground. And, and then there's another common story that goes around. That, that such and such a well was shut in. That's, that's oil field talk. And I don't know much of that. That well was shut in, which means it was capped. It had depleted itself. And, and the, <clears throat> and the pumping unit had pumped all of the oil out of the ground. Until it was non-productive. It was not worthwhile. I want to say to everybody in this building that we live in a world that is like a pumping unit that is constantly sucking life and sucking energy and spiritual power out of every one of our lives. You hear me, friend? All of the beat of this world is not putting anything in your soul or anything in your heart or anything to encourage you to live for God. Everything about daily living, everything about daily life is sucking something out of you. Uh, but, oh God, we have come to the great restorer tonight. We have come to a ladies' meeting tonight. We have come to a rally. Praise God. Uh, and I believe the Holy Ghost uh, is going to put something back in us tonight. The God of heaven is going to renew us again. Praise God. Praise God. Oh, I want the Lord to touch me again tonight. Hallelujah, hallelujah. <coughs> Praise the Lord. My, my. I don't know about you. Um, <coughs> and, um, and I'm just going to confess. And, and this is not a confession service. But I'll, I'll just confess. Now, I've been living for the Lord 52 years. The first day of May. Started when I was 14. If that's of any interest to you, 
But I'll tell you, I don't have it made yet. <clears throat> None of us have it made. And, and there have been times that I've walked on the highest mountains, but I've walked in some low valleys. Amen. And I've always resorted to prayer and to fasting and to the Bible and to going to church. I've, I've never quit going to church, never quit trying to live for God. I tell people, you know, if I backslide, it's going to be on the way to church or on the way home from church, it looks like. <laughs> That's about all we do is go to church. And uh, But I'm going to tell you, you can just go to church and go to church, and you can get mighty low going to church. Hallelujah. Now, all you super spiritual people, you don't know what I'm talking about. Amen. But all us carnal people knows what Brother Coon's talking about. Every once in a while, you can just you can just kind of be going through the motions, and you just kind of be dragging through the motions, and you can just be doing it out of obligation, and you can be doing it out of responsibility, and you just going because you know you need to go, and you're walking because you need to walk, and you're clapping because you need to clap. Sometimes I preach just because it's time to preach. Amen. And I'm not trying to be ugly here tonight. I'm just simply telling you. You get to the place you feel used up. You feel that the iron is blunt. I've been just hacking so long with this knife until I'm dull, I'm discouraged, I'm tired. And then, and brother, listen, if you don't wet the edge, the Bible says you've got to put more strength to it. Amen. But after a while, you can just turn the mic up so high. After a while, you can just holler so loud. After a while, you can just preach so long. But somewhere along the way, you better stop and get wetted up again. You better get sharpened up again. You better get the joy back inside. You better get the anointing back again. Hallelujah. And that's what God wants to do in this kind of a meeting. Praise God. He's put that joy of the Lord back in our soul again. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. <laughs> Anybody here know what I'm talking about? Amen. And I'm not preaching to you, and I'm not trying to tell you that you're backslid. I'm not trying to tell you that you're less than what you ought to be with God. Amen. I'm just telling you the living truth tonight. Now, I know it would be more interesting if I named the Antichrist to you. Hallelujah. And by the way, I know who it is. I got a book that told me, and then a few days later I got a letter that told me it was somebody else. I really hadn't figured out which one it is. <clears throat> but anyway, if I was preaching on that, it'd be more interesting to you. But I'm going to tell you, some of you have been fighting a hateful boss. Some of you may be having conflict in your home. Some of you may be fighting wayward children. And some of you young people may be struggling with parents that are opposing your life. And your walk with God. I'm just here to tell you, we're living in a world that is just sucking the energy out of us. And it seems like we're hacking with a dull knife. And we're going to church with dull spirits. And we're trying to do the work of God with a dull edge. I'm telling you, the Bible said wisdom is profitable. We need to sit down and sharpen up ourselves. We need to hear from God. We need a new touch of the Holy Ghost on the inside of our soul. Praise God. Oh God, oh God, oh God. <laughs> Help us tonight. I'm not here fussing at you. I'm not battering at you tonight. I'm telling you, I want the Lord to strengthen you again. Hallelujah. I want you to get up and go at it again. Praise God. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. You thinking about getting a divorce? I hope when I get through preaching... You get up and say, bless God, I ain't going nowhere. We're going to try it again. <laughs> Praise God. If you're thinking about backsliding, I hope you just say, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to live for God. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. Oh, I tell you, I just made up my mind a long time ago that this old coon is going to live for God on the mountain or in the valley. Praise God. <laughs> praise God. Praise God. You're going to run into a lot of things you don't like. <clears throat> in fact, I'll just tell you the living truth. I love preaching in places like this. I really do. I like this building. And I like your pastor. 
I just wish you had on a gray suit and a brown necktie. Hallelujah. I'd feel better. You just look too spiffy. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know why I'm enjoying preaching here? I'm not worried a lick about the air conditioner. Hallelujah. <laughs> now, I hope y'all are all comfortable, but I'm not, I don't really care if you're about to freeze to death or your family. I just really don't. I'm not worried if every commode in this building runs over tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. I ain't worried a lick about the sound system, Brother Proctor. I'm, I'm out of Gina. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Glory to God. Hey, Gina, I got people fanning and I got people wrapped up in quilts and blankets on any given night. I got them telling the sound man do this and I've got them telling him do that. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. After church, somebody's always coming by and, and saying, Brother Coon, the men's commode's running. <laughs> Hallelujah. If I get the victory, I lose it before I get off of the platform. <laughs> Amen. You know, I don't know why a grown man don't do what I'm going to do after he tells me the commode's running. Why don't we go back and just shake the handle a little bit? Just kick it a little bit. My God. Don't, don't torment the pastor to death with a bunch of junk. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. People say, you know, we got the best little old pastor you've ever seen. He can paint, and he can plumb, and, and he can lay carpet, and, and he can mow grass. He ain't much of a preacher, but boy, he can do everything else. Well, the reason he ain't much of a preacher, you're working him to death doing everything else. My God, give him time to pray and fast, and he'll know how to preach. Praise God. <clears throat> oh, God, help us tonight. Amen. So I'm enjoying preaching here in Gina tonight. I'm out of Gina, I'm sorry. Out of Gina. I'm mixed up all the way around. Amen. They ain't got nothing this nice in Gina. And you better than that. Hallelujah. But oh, if you just give it out, give it out, give it out, give it out. All of the time, all of the time, all of the time, all of the time. And you just use, 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 use. After a while, <clears throat> there is, there is, Oppression and there's depression and there's fear and there's all kinds of things that begins to set in to our hearts. That's the reason the, the Bible talks about a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. It's good to bring out good things. But I'm going to tell you, you've got to put something good in there to bring something good out. Hallelujah. Brother, if you're going to be a shining light, you're going to have to get some oil inside of your vessel. If you're going to go out of here with the power of God, you're going to have to come in here and get the power of God. Amen. I'm just being very honest with you tonight. Hallelujah. But oh God, if we could realize that we live in a world that we are just giving and giving and giving and giving, and nobody knows that any better than these pastors. Anybody working with people problems, anybody working with people situations, it is a giving and a giving and a giving, and the burnout rate is high. But you know, Solomon said wisdom is profitable to direct. <clears throat> and, and if he don't stop and wet the edge, then he's got to use more strength. I'm here to tell you, this is an edge wetting service tonight. This is a night to get sharpened up. This is a night to get rejuvenated. This is a night to get restored. This is a night to get the joy back inside of your heart and say, I'm ready to go again. I'm ready to fight again. Hallelujah. Oh, God, we do every one of us again. Amen, amen, amen. <clears throat> Praise God. I was reading not long ago, and I, I, I often wondered <clears throat> what happens to old codgers such as I am. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. And you get to where you can't half see and you can't half hear. You're on your way, buddies, I'm telling you. Oh, you've got a long ways to go, Brother Littlefield. 
Hallelujah. Stooped over. Wear out. Amen. <clears throat> I told somebody not long ago. In fact, I told Medina. I said, and I've been there a little over 28 years. And in those 28 years, I've had people come in and they're hobbling. They said, Brother Coon, my old knee is just wore out. And I've had them come in holding their arms and say, my old elbow, my arm is just wore out. Or they come in hobbling and they say, my old hip bones is just wore out. Can't hardly go anymore. My old eyes are just wore out. Can't see anymore. But I've never had anybody walk in and say, Brother Coon, my old tongue is just about wore out. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm telling you, <laughs> it's running full strength when they're on their deathbed. Hallelujah. And ever thinking one of them's got a cell phone. Oh, God help us. No wonder I'm dull. Amen. But I was reading the other day, and, and I read that the human body, that our bodies, of course, we know that our bone marrow makes blood. And the, the blood that is produced by a uh, younger to middle-aged person, uh, <clears throat> your body produces every 24 hours, and this is kind of astounding to me, every 24 hours, your body produces 227 billion and 800 million red blood cells. That's astounding. Every 24 hours, it does that. And that's what keeps your body functioning so well. All of that oxygen and healing and all of that. Your body produces 90 billion, 800 million white blood cells every 24 hours. Every 24 hours, your body produces 227 billion, 200 million platelets. Same amount as red blood cells. <clears throat> now, that's what keeps you energized and feeling good and your eyes sharp and your legs and your joints and everything working good. Now, what was astounding to me was that as you age, as you get older, that bone marrow that produces all of those living cells that carries oxygen, carries healing, takes away waste out of your body. That wonderful marrow of your bones that produces that life-giving fluid that we call blood. The life is in the blood. <clears throat> that same bone marrow, as you age, begins to turn to fatty tissue. And by the time that you get my age, somewhere around 50% of your bone marrow no longer functions. It is like a fatty tissue. And so consequently, the rejuvenation and the renewal of your bloodstream begins to diminish and it begins to die. And you have less protection from disease, so you have a lot of onset diseases from age. You have a lot of crippling effects. You have a lot of sagging and wrinkles and on and on and on. You are affected in every segment of your body because of the destruction of the bone marrow. And that's what, that's what happens to all of us. It's just a natural phenomenon. <clears throat> and, you know, I got to thinking about that. And that's the reason that little by little we die. But then I got to thinking about the blood of Jesus that gives us spiritual life, that renews, that cleanses, that washes away our faults and our guilts and our sins. That blood that we sing about that will never lose its power. I want to tell you that that blood of Jesus Christ has never diminished. Hallelujah. It's not the proper term, but I'm going to use it in the sense of a physical term. The bone marrow has never started turning to fat. That rejuvenation, that life, 
that comes through the blood of Jesus Christ is just as real and just as fresh tonight if you're 16 or 65 as it's ever been. Hallelujah. I wonder tonight if we'll just let the blood wash us anew. I wonder if we'll let the Lord sharpen us up anew tonight. Praise God and revive us again like we really, really, really need to be revived. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. 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 I'm going to ask the musicians to come. I'm going to quit. <clears throat> the mall is closed. Fifteen minutes after nine. I guess it closes at nine o'clock. But if it don't, you ain't going to make it anyway. So stay with me a few minutes. Amen. You know, in the, in the Bible, one of the strategies of the enemy, one of the strategies of the enemy, and the Philistines used this with Israel more than one occasion. <clears throat> now go back in your mind to somewhat of a primitive system. Not totally primitive, but somewhat. And the Philistines would come over into the land of Israel and they wouldn't kill everybody. They wouldn't see who all they could destroy. <clears throat> they would just come over and they'd get a select few people. Brother Littlefield, out of Israel. You know who they got? They got the Smiths. Now, not the name. Everybody, I don't know of anybody in Israel that was named Smith. But they got the Smiths. The blacksmiths. <clears throat> the men that knew how to make swords and spears and plows and weapons of war. They come and got the Smiths. And they took them captive into the land of the Philistines. And they would do this. Other warring nations would come. And the prime person they wanted in Israel was not priests or prophets. They wanted smiths. They wanted the guy that knew how to heat a forge, that knew the molecular structure of metal. And, and had a strong arm that he could take a hammer and he could take an anvil and he could pound an edge on a piece of iron. They wanted that guy out of Israel. <clears throat> Read it in the Bible. They would leave him a file. We all know what a file is. To file their mattocks and to file their hoe that they could chop in the dirt a little bit. But we're not going to leave you any smiths. You know why? Because if you've got a blacksmith in Israel, he's going to make you a sword. He's going to give you something to fight with. He knows how to sharpen an edge. He knows how to pound. He knows how to turn on the heat just right. And you've watched them, and I have too, you older people. Striking that edge. Striking that edge. Sharpening the weapons. Making the weapons. But if we can get rid of this guy that knows how to sharpen a weapon, that knows how to forge an instrument of war, we don't have to worry about the priest. We don't have to worry about... Uh, all of the big tough guys because technically you are weaponless. You have nothing to fight with. You are totally destroyed. You're totally muted. You have no ability to defend yourself. You know what the devil would like to do to this church? <clears throat> and no slam against you guys. I really admire musicians and singers. And I mean that. The devil will die to destroy you. But you know what? <clears throat> He's not really your prime target. It's not really the Sunday school teacher. It's not really the choir members. You know what the devil would like to do? He'd like to take this guy out of the pulpit. He'd like to take the blacksmith out of this church. 
that knows how to get up here on a Sunday morning, a Sunday night, a Wednesday night Bible study. And he knows that there's a dullness. The edge is blunt. You've been fighting the devil. But this man of God has the ability to take that word of the Lord that's like a fire. And it's like a hammer. And he knows how to put an edge back on us. That we can walk out that door and we can fight again. And we've got new energy and we've got new life. And we're not afraid of the devil. Praise God. Oh, you hear me tonight. I want the Lord to come down and help us tonight. I want Him to put some preachers in this apostolic movement. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell every saint here, you better back up your pastor. You better stand behind that man of God when he stands in this pulpit. And it seems like he's just pounding away. I'm going to tell you what he's doing. He's giving you something to fight with. He's giving you something to defeat the devil with. And you better stand behind and say, Priest, brother, we need you more than we've ever needed you. Praise God. Praise God. <laughs> Let's stand together tonight. How many of you want the Lord to sharpen you up a little bit? My, 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 my. God help us tonight. I don't want somebody to get a hold of me, Brother Proctor, with a file and just put a little edge there. And that's all I've got. But I want somebody to take that word that's like a fire and it's like a hammer. And I want them to, to just pound that edge that cannot be blunted easily, that cannot be dulled easily. Give me something to fight with, Pastor. Give me something to stand with. Give me something to go to school with. Give me something that will work on the job. Hallelujah. I've come to tell you that God wants to restore us tonight. You've got to use energy. You've got to use strength. You've got to give out in this world. But something has got to be put back inside of us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I don't know where it's at. I don't really know how to describe it. And I cannot tell you all of the little ramifications about it. But I just want to say to everybody in this building <laughs> that within every one of us, on the inside of us, somewhere, is a cavity. There's a spot. David describes it as a cut. In all of us, there is a cut. And obviously, that cut can become empty. We have nothing left. We've gone as far as we can go. Has any of you, either verbally or mentally, just simply said, I've gone as far as I can go. I can't go any further. Carry this load as long as I can. I feel empty. I feel dry. Hallelujah. But David talked about getting in the presence of God. He talked about getting to his shepherd. And he said, that shepherd, that made him not the wound. He said, he makes my cup to run over. My cup runneth over. My cup runneth over. Does anybody need your cup refilled? Anybody want your cup to run over again tonight? Oh, God, help us. The law of use wears us down. It depletes us. There's units of energy that are given in marriage. There's emotional energy that's given in raising kids. There's emotional energy that's given out in cleaning the house and going to church and taking care of the cares of life. There's energy given out in coming to church, working at the altar, singing in the choir, teaching Sunday school, mowing grass, vacuuming the carpet. There's, there's amounts 
physical and spiritual, emotional energy that's leaving us from all of the activities of life. But we've just come together tonight to pause. And the Bible said wisdom directs. It's just really smart sometimes to sit down and take the time to sharpen the edge. And it's really smart tonight for us to take a few minutes and say, God, sharpen the edge. I'm blunt. I'm dull. And you don't have to be old to get weary. It didn't happen to any of us. I picked up a little poem not long ago. And it said, when things go wrong, as they sometimes will, when the road you're trudging seems all a hill, when the funds are low and the debts are high, and you want to smile, but you have to smile, when care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but don't you quit. Life is queer with its twists and turns, as every one of us sometimes learns. And many a failure turns about when he might have won had he stuck it out. Don't give up, though the pace seems slow. You may succeed with another blow. Success is failure turned inside out, the silver tint of the clouds of doubt. And you never can tell how close you are. It may be near when it seems so far. So stick to the fight when your heart is hit. It's when things seem worse that you must not quit. God bless you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Brother Coon. Let's lift up our hands to the Lord. I wonder if there's somebody just through the cares of life, the burdens of every day, can identify with this preaching tonight. If you'd like to come to this altar and say, God, just through life, not, not sin, but just through life, I've become a little dull in my spiritual walk with you. And I need you to touch me, sharpen me. I need you to renew me in some areas. I need you to restore me. I need you to work on me tonight. I need to go back to the anvil. I need you to do a work in my life. Would you step out from where you are and let's make our way to this front as they begin to sing. I believe God wants to renew some folks. God wants to touch some people. Not backslid. I'm not away from God. I still love the Lord as much as I always have. But I want to be renewed. I need Him to touch me one more time. I need him to fill my cup tonight. As David said, until it's running over.
Brethren, if you couldn't find a brother, brother to pray for. And sister, if you couldn't find a sister to pray for. Made for me from different assemblies, but we're all part of one body. When one is hurting, the other needs to be sensitive to the need. Let's reach out to somebody as they begin to sing again. Let's find somebody to pray with, somebody to connect with.
us thank the Lord for Jesus. Thank you, God, for your word, the encouragement that we receive. Thank you, Lord, for your presence, your anointing that is here. Thank you, God, for answering prayers that I encourage you, individuals in this house. We give you praise for them. Thanks, Lord. We certainly appreciate your attendance for this rally tonight. Thank you, Brother Coon, for such a timely word from the Lord. God bless each of you.